Hello, and welcome to the WCET State Authorization Network webcast. Cheryl, please go ahead and, and advance the slide. Today's webcast is the NC Sarah Enrollment Data Collection and Reporting Webinar. Next slide, please. My name is Megan Raymond, and I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. We have a lot of content to get through today, and as we go along, if you have any questions, please enter them into the question box. The moderator will get to those questions during the final Q&A portion. The webinar is being recorded, and we will share a link to the recording, the PowerPoint, and any resources that were shared next week. You can also access today's PowerPoint slide by clicking on the handout box and downloading the PDF document. You can also follow along on Twitter by following the hashtag WCETWebcast. And now I'd like to pass it over to Cheryl, who will take us through the rest of the webinar. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. We have a lot of good information to share. And what I'd like to offer you right here is an overview. We'll start with a little bit about the data committee for NC Sarah. I will move into some of the enrollment reporting, what the basics are. We'll move into what will institutions report and what is different for spring 2017 than was in 2016. And we'll be happy to take your questions at the end. If you have any questions during the presentation, please add them into the question box. You may do that throughout. If we find that there is a question in regard to um, having difficulty with the audio or something to that effect, we'll certainly address that throughout the, the presentation. Otherwise, we're going to save the questions until the end of the presentation. And if we are not able to get to everyone's question, we will be able to hold on to the questions, share them with our presenters, and get the answers to you, uh, much like we'll be doing with the uh, slides and uh, with the um, recording of, the, of this presentation. So we will monitor that question box. I'm Cheryl Dowd. I'm the director for the State Authorization Network, SAN, with WCET. Today, we have three presenters. First, we have Marshall Hill who's the Executive Director of NC SARA, the National Council for State Authorization Reciprocity Agreements, which provides a voluntary regional approach to state oversight of post-secondary distance education. His involvement with SARA goes back to the President's Forum Council of State Governments drafting team and moved through to the development of the SARA agreements and the country's four regional education compacts and the membership on the National Commission on Regulatory of Post-Secondary Distance Education. Prior to assuming his NC SARA position in August of 2013, he served eight years as the SHEO for Nebraska. Before his work in Nebraska, he was Assistant Commissioner for Universities and Health-Related Institutions at the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Next, we'll have Jennifer Shanika. She is the Technical Operations Manager and Communications Coordinator for NC SARA. She leads a fascinating life in Colorado, assisting the executives and regional directors with NC SARA. And we have Russ Poulin, who is the Policy and Analysis, Direct, Analysis um, Director for Policy and Analysis with WCET. He organizes WCET's national policy and research activities. He edits the WCET's Frontiers blog, coordinates WCET's research efforts, and works on e-learning consortia issues. He represented the distance education community in the U.S. Department of Education's 2014 negotiated rulemaking process. Previously, he coordinated distance education activities for the North Dakota University System. He holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado Denver and a master's from the University of Northern Colorado. We're very fortunate to have these presenters with us today. We'll start with Russ Poulin, who's going to give us some information about the data committee. Russ, I'll turn it to you. Excellent. Uh, thank you so much, Cheryl. And, uh, and it, let's go ahead and go to the data, data committee. I uh, want to uh, thank everyone for allowing me to, uh, to talk today and give some background on, on the data committee and what, what was done here. As you, as you may recall, for those who've been in, involved in SARA, 
uh, that last year that there was an initial uh, data uh, collection that was done and that there's thought that there's some need to uh, uh, improve on that. And so uh, thanks to Marshall and the NC Sarah staff that they brought together uh, a variety of people here. We didn't want too large a group, but we wanted uh, the uh, representation from uh, uh, some of the different different regions and also from different types of institutions. And then we see Lana there who's uh, uh, representing one of the uh, the state agencies. And so I wanted to get some input uh, from uh, people who are very involved in the data and very involved in state authorization uh, across different different sectors. And I thought that this was a, a really good group that were thoughtful in their discussions. Let's move to the uh, to the next slide. And as I uh, mentioned before, uh, that there was uh, uh, data that was collected the year before. Uh, there were some uh, uh, issues with confusion on some of the things, and so we really wanted to uh, work on uh, clarifying uh, cl clarifying some of that confusion because the, there was the uh, issue of uh, if you had uh, fewer than 10 students in a state to report zero, and that uh, confused people and made us wonder about things, and we wondered whether we really had to do that or not, and then uh, should we include uh, internships or uh, practica or experiential learning in it, that we had questions about that. And then also some uh, uh, very specific and very unique uh, questions that came from some of the uh, some of the people, and it was very helpful to have the, uh, the regional uh, coordinators, some of the uh, regional SARA coordinators involved in this because they were able to uh, uh, give us uh, uh, some of your feedback and some of your thoughts, and so let's move to the uh, to the next next slide. And that really was something that we wanted to do uh, was that with having the feedback that you have been to the regional coordinators, that we really wanted to uh, listen to what had happened or had not happened in the field, and then try to make decisions uh, based upon that. Uh, we're also we're looking for trains, both figuratively and uh, literally. Um, uh, because we, uh, there are some things, you know, what are the uh, types of things that would uh, run us over and keep us from uh, actually doing the, the, the data correct, uh, correctly. Uh, and then also you may sometime today uh, hear the train outside our window. And so we met in this, in uh, the building where which is located and we're right by the, the trains. And so we're always watching out not to be run over literally by trains. Uh, so we, and we had no casualties while they were here. And so, Let's move on to the next slide. And one of the things that we uh, really wanted to do is to continue to work with the uh, U.S. Department of Education's integrated uh, post-secondary education data system, IPEDS. Uh, that's their series of surveys that they do and the definitions uh, that they, they use uh, uh, for this that at least to keep as close as possible to that work. Uh, so that uh, your institutions are already reporting distance education enrollment data um, to iPads and try to keep to it. There's extra information that Sarah needs, and so it's we're not. Re so there are uh, recommendations that you're going to see or, or requirements that you're going to see that go beyond that. But we wanted to try to keep as close to that as possible, uh, so that you're not doing something that is completely different than what you did before. And with that, and that gives you some background on the uh, committee and what they were looking at. And I'll turn it over to Marshall and Jennifer now. Let's move to their slide. Mm -hmm. Well, good afternoon. Thank you, Russ and Cheryl. We're glad to be with you to talk a bit about the data reporting that's going to be starting uh, latter part of May. So uh, let's just dive right on in. So, next slide, please. So the first question is, who reports? Uh, the simple answer is all SARA institutions. We're occasionally uh, asked uh, by an institution that just recently joined whether they have to report. Yes, uh, all SARA institutions, uh, when they sign on and make their application to be a SARA participating institution agree to provide this data, and it's basically data 
that your institution uh, is required to provide to IPEDS. So it shouldn't be that heavy a lift, and it's backward-looking data in any case. So all SARA institutions are to report. So Jennifer, when do institutions report? Institutions report between May 22nd and June 14th, and you can, um, around May 22nd, every <coughs> single active in, active institution contact will receive an institution-specific link that will send them to their, their specific report. They have any time between the 22nd and June 14th to fill this out. Um, it's really simple. <laughs> it, 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 the hardest part is for you guys to actually find the information. Filling out the report is boom, boom, boom. Um, how do institutions report? Like I said, they will be sent a URL um, link to every institution contact we have on file that is active. We do have some people who are, you know, have opted out of emails. Obviously, they won't get them. Um, we encourage you to decide which person will be responsible for reporting and submitting your institution information, but there is no need to inform us who that person is, so you don't need to be telling us, hey, so-and-so will be doing that. We trust you guys to do that, um, and once the your institution's reporting has been submitted, we will be sending it, the system will send an email to, um, to everybody in that institution contact list saying, hey, you're submitted, you're good. Okay, thanks. So what do institutions report? The next slide. So Sarah institutions report the number of students enrolled exclusively in distance education. You remember that definition that Russ uh, showed you just a moment ago, delivered outside the home state of the institution. The next slide provides a little more detail. So your institution this spring is reporting to IPEDS in the particular field labeled, as we have indicated here in red, the number of students that your institution has that are enrolled exclusively in distance education, and they are located in the United States, but not in the same state as the institution. <clears throat> so that is, you, if you're an institution in Colorado, you would report all of the enrollees that you have in other states, uh, but not enrollees that you have in uh, uh, France or Germany or Canada. All right? So this is a field that your institution, by the time you report in May, will have already provided to iPads. Next slide, please. So in that field that your institution by mid-May will already have reported, your institution will report a single number, which is the sum of all of your out-of-state but within the country distance education enrollments. And what we ask you to do is to disaggregate that number by state, territory, or district. It seems logical that in order to come up with that number in the first place, you had to sum the enrollments that you have in other states. Uh, and all we are asking here is that you disaggregate that by state, territory, and district. <clears throat> and Jennifer, when again do they report? Why? Marshall, thank you for <laughs> asking. <laughs> that will be between May 22nd and June 14th. Okay, next slide, please. So, last year there was some confusion around the idea of a cell size limit. <clears throat> Why did we have a cell size limit in the first place? Frankly, that was a decision that I made in order to forestall an argument that we just did not have time to deal with at the time. Early on as Sarah was being developed, we had some people say, well, if you collect enrollment information, 
you will be violating FERPA, which is the federal data collection parameters that, uh, that protect student privacy. Uh, we never believed that that was true, but it was a battle we did not want to fight at the time. So to avoid that battle, we created the idea of telling institutions last year that if you have fewer than 10 students in a state, report zero for that state. Uh, this led to a lot of problems. Frankly, we had almost a third or over a third of reporting institutions reported zeros in all states. Now, our cell size directive obviously could make that true for some institutions, but not for a third of institutions. Institutions join SARA primarily because they have enrollments in other states. So we have eliminated that directive for this year. So for, 200 and, for 2017, we want you to report actual enrollment numbers for each state, regardless of the number. So if yours is an institution in Ohio and you have 27 students in Illinois, report 27. If you have two students in Wyoming, report two. Uh, if you have zero enrollments in a state, report zero but zero means zero. Now, we had in 2014 gotten a legal opinion on whether Sarah's data collection policies would violate FERPA. And the legal opinion very strongly said, no, it would not. Uh, this year, with the elimination of the cell size limit, I asked uh, our attorneys at Education Council, which is a law firm in Washington, D.C., to take another look at this, specifically whether removing the cell size directive uh, would then result in a violation of FERPA. And their answer was, again, no, this, this would not. Because I expect there might be a fair amount of interest in this, we have included the text of the legal opinion in the reporting guide that we just published uh, day before yesterday, mm -hmm. I believe. Yes, Monday. Next slide. The other question last year was about uh, whether or not experiential learning placements should be reported. And we contributed to the confusion of that. I apologize for that. For this year, we are directing institutions to not include experiential learning placements in the enrollment data you submit. Now, by experiential learning placements, uh, let's say if the University of Louisville has a nursing program, which they do, and if some of their students do clinical rotations, not in Louisville, Kentucky, but across the river in Indiana. Um, we're telling you this year, do not report those experiential learning placements in the data that you report to us. Why? Because you should not have included them in what you report to iPads as well. Now, state regulators are very interested in this information, and they press us to collect it. And part of the bargain agreement that we reached with our colleagues in the regulatory community was, a part of that was that we would collect this data. Because many of them, or some of them at least, required it of institutions that achieved uh, state authorization in their states. And so as they joined SARA, they were giving up the ability to require institutions to report that. So we have told them that we are going to get that back. So what we are doing now is for 2017, this May, early June, do not report experiential learning placements. 
We will encourage voluntary reporting of such placements for next year's data collection and require it for spring 2019. This last provision is something that I want our board to consider uh, and approve, and I'm going to recommend this to them for their May 2017 meeting, but I'm fairly confident that they will approve this. So what will we be asking you to report? Give us a little while to work on that. We're going to assemble another uh, advisory committee with representation and contact in to the various fields that have these experiential learning placements. And we'll be providing that, um, that information to you later. Next. All right, what's different for spring 2017 reporting? Well, um, we thought you guys might like this. We've added a space for comments. <laughs> nice comments. Um, this is based to briefly comment on any apparent an anomalies. Thank you, Marshall, in your data uh, context or explanation for something that you might want to further expand upon. It's not going to be a whole page worth of comments. It'll be a comment box, um, but we also asked you not to ask questions here as that's not how we will be using this comment box, but we think that some of you might find that um, helpful. So helpful. what if they do have questions, Jennifer? Um, read the guide, which we have on our website. If you have not directly um, received it, we have it on several places on your website. Read the guide. Contact your local state portal entity or your regional director. They are in this now and uh, ready to handle it. And also we have created a specific email address, data at ncsara.org, for any questions specifically for enrollment reporting and we uh, respond pretty quickly to you about that. And next slide, please. And um, as Marshall mentioned briefly earlier, the guide was sent out um, Monday, on, which was the 27th. We also have it on the website if you want to review it. And we encourage you to review it. Um, You'll find it on our website at the right side of our homepage. There's a blog article uh, with uh, links to both the uh, enrollment data reporting guide and the uh, data sharing agreement, which is quite similar to last year's. And as you recall, your institutional agreement is incorporated in your data report. So when you are working on that, there's a box for them to check agreement, correct? Correct. And that's pretty much what we have to say, Cheryl. It's, it's also, really quickly, it's also on the home page on the left side, ah, okay. a direct link to these documents are right there for you as well. So. Okay. I think that's all from us. See? Simple. Well, that was <laughs> terrific. Thank you so much for explaining that. And we have received several questions in the, ch in the chat box. I think a lot of this has to do with confirming uh, what they thought you heard. So if you wouldn't mind uh, if I could just provide these questions and if you all, whichever one of you feels the most comfortable responding. Uh, for example, the first one is confirming that uh, they are not to, not to input a number from their institution's home state, even if they have numerous distance education students residing within their state. Right, that is correct. Enter zero for your own state. Okay. Cheryl, let me mention something sure. that I forgot to emphasize. Uh, in, in going through earlier. I think last year a good deal of confusion resulted from the fact that on most campuses the person who manages distance education and who is the institutional contact is not the same person on campus who reports to IPEDS. So I think for those of you who are charged to do this reporting for your institution, my best advice to you is find the person on your campus 
who reports to iPads and make a friend of that person. They have the information that you need uh, and they understand all of this, they understand the fields, and, and that will save you an enormous amount of grief. That's great. That is something that we suggest uh, with our state authorization network folks um, to make sure that they are working with the key stakeholders and other holders of information at their institutions. That's valuable advice. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Related to the confirmation question that I started with, uh, this, this participant's question relates to the branch campus situation, and their concern is it's a little twist. Uh, what about a branch campus in another state that also has numerous distance education students residing in that state? With both the home state and a state with a branch campus, there's a brick and mortar approved location, so including right. distance edge students these will skew the results, so how should they manage that? Handle that in, in the same way that your institution did in regard to their report to IPEDS. So if the branch campus makes a separate report to IPEDS, use that information. If the enrollments of that institution or the institution's branch campus are incorporated in the iPads reporting of the main campus, uh, do it in that way. Okay. And this is, this is a rather lengthy question, so please uh, bear with me as I come through it. Sure. iPads asks for the number of each of the following. Enrolled exclusively in distance education courses offered at your institution. Students who are enrolled only in courses that are considered distance education courses at your institution. Enrolled in some, but not all. Uh, distance education courses, students who are enrolled in at least one course but are not enrolled exclusively in distance education courses. And uh, so they ask all of the distance education at this institution include a few weeks at their brick and mortar location. So we have zero for exclusively in distance ed and many for some but not all. Should they report zero or include um, the many many students that are in some but not all distance education courses as they report to iPads. Oh Lord. <laughs> Russ, uh, are you still with us? I am. What do you think about that? <clears throat> well, the exclusively distance education talks about that all of the courses are considered uh, distance education courses. Mm -hmm. Now there's so there's a little bit of debate about about that. Is that they the Department of Education uses a very restrictive definition of a distance education course, where it's nearly a hundred percent we come in for orientation and all that. But if you you as your institution has interpreted that, even if they come in for two weeks and that you're reporting those as uh, distance education courses, then it would only be those students who took all of their courses via what you're classifying as distance education courses, those would be the ones that would go into that exclusive category. And and it's only the exclusive category that uh, Sarah is asking for. If you've classified them and have decided to classify them as other than distance education, then that's outside of what Sarah is asking for. Uh, does that make sense, Marshall? Does that fit with what, what your thoughts yeah. are? And the, the reason I, um, I palmed this off on Russ first is because uh, Russ and colleagues are doing some work to make recommendations to iPads in regard to this very issue. It's not terribly helpful the way that collection is now done. It's confusing for institutions. We hope that that's going to get better. Uh, as things go forward, but uh, I agree with Russ's uh, um, determination here. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is many, from this person, many of our institutions in our consortia have changed the person responsible for Sarah. How should they get you the new contact person if they know it at the consortium system level? I'm going to ask Jennifer to respond to that one. Uh, the best way to do that is for them to contact their state uh, portal entity with the contact change, and they should be able to take care of that right then. Simple email. And uh, you can find 
if you don't know, you can find the contact information for your state's SARA portal entity by go to, going to the NC SARA website, mm -hmm. click on the map, click on your state, and at the bottom of the list of your state's SARA institutions is the contact information for your state's SARA portal entity person. There is also a, a nav, on the nav bar, there's contacts, drop down, state portal entities, has everybody there. There are several ways to find the information and, um, you know, they're, they're the best people to, to help you out there. Great. Okay, somebody uh, would like a little bit of clarification about the language of students enrolled exclusively in distance education courses. This phrasing implies that the students are taking only distance edu course, education courses and are not enrolled in any traditional courses in their home state. Um, the person's guessing that uh, what we actually mean is students enrolled in exclusively distance education courses. Would this be accurate? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, let's see. I, I agree. I, I agree that it is confusing. And that's why I'm hopeful that uh, Russ and his colleagues' uh, recommendations to the iPads folks will, will get favorable reception. And, and Marshall, that, uh, that, yeah, I agree. It's, it's that it's, the institution has said all these courses are distance education uh, courses. Now, there's, again, there's the definition that's provided by the uh, Department of Higher Education, which, which makes it pretty close to 100% of the activity is is online, but I know a lot of institutions that they're, they've used slightly different definitions. So whatever it is that you're reporting to iPads as distance education would be what you would use for this as well. And it's, it's troublesome uh, because, as you know, uh, institutions are endlessly and appropriately uh, fine-tuning, adjusting how they serve students. Uh, and that's a good thing, but it makes it difficult to count. Uh, you know there is not one standard way of providing online education, uh, and there shouldn't be. Uh, different courses should have different ways that are optimum for serving students. Uh, which is a good thing, but then when you come around after the fact and try to count those things, uh, that's where the trouble comes and that's where the confusion lies. So w what goes hand in hand with that is this, this next question, because evidently this appears to be a student at an institution or many students at an institution may live near like a state line and they're crossing the border in, into the institution. So the, the participant asks, if the student lives out of state but takes a combination of on-campus courses and distance education, are these students included in the enrolled numbers? You know, we once got a, a question about whether or not a student walking the Appalachian Trail uh, triggered physical presence in each of the states that she was going to walk through. And, you know, the answer was that each state had a different answer. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I fall back on, on the, the general directive to don't try to figure this out separately from your iPads coordinator. Report to us in the same way you made that decision when your institution reported to iPads. Uh, will that yield perfection? No, of course not. We can't get there because of the variability of institutional practice and the department's uh, the department's uh, ways to deal with this. So use your best judgment, but basically, again, report in the same way you made these, your institution made these decisions in regard to your report to iPads, and then disaggregate that by state. And I know this is not a satisfying answer, but I think and, and, it's the best I can provide. 
And, well, and Marshall, I think that th this one actually uh, gets to be simpler because this talks about that this the student in the term took face-to-face -face courses, so non-distance ed courses. Since you're asking for exclusively distance ed courses, where they live doesn't matter. The fact that they uh, are taking a mixture of face-to-face -face and distance courses means that they would not be counted as exclusively distance ed. Okay. Okay. Okay, these next two questions are, are just for clarification. Uh, one of our participants just wants to clarify that experiential learning refers to all types of internships, practical, clinical rotations. Just experiential learning is the generic term that's given to those types of activities. Is that correct? Yes. And then uh, the next one is confirming that um, boots on the ground is not distance education, so no data should be collected regarding face-to-face. -face. That, that is correct. Uh, let's see. Uh, we have a question here. Which screen in the fall enrollment survey? Is that, uh, is that in regard to what the iPads is requesting? Russ, do we'd, you know? we'd have to. I don't know off the top. We'd have to go uh, go back and look to see which screen in the fall enrollment report has the the distance ed thing. I don't have that immediately. Okay. We we have provided for you in an earlier slide the, the name of that cell. Okay. In yeah. which report, uh, I, and Jim Parks provided the the number designator of that cell uh, there. Okay. F two zero one five A. Okay. Underscore just all. <laughs> but okay. that is the number that your institution reported in the cell that is labeled thusly, as we have in red here, is the number that you need to disaggregate by state and then report to NC Sarah. Let's see. On various slides, you have indicated students and in other places enrollments. Is there a distinction? No. Okay. Uh, the next participant has a question about uh, future reporting of experiential learning. Uh, he or she finds that at their institution, they're very decentralized currently and have not captured this in a, in a systematic manner. So they're wondering about how much advance notice that they will receive before, uh, so they know exactly what is required of them. Do you anticipate well, a time frame? Yeah, uh, I think that by um, certainly before the end of this calendar year, we we will have that laid out. But I think it's um, very likely to that we will ask institutions to report these kinds of experiential learning placements by state, by two-digit SIP code. SIP is CIP, classic, Classification of Instructional Programs. It is a way to classify academic programs by various disciplines. So there is a uh, for example, uh, there, there is a SIP number for nursing, and then it's a two-digit number, I believe. And then within nursing, there are all kinds of different types of nursing, pediatric nursing, geriatric nursing, uh, intensive care nursing, et cetera, et cetera. So we will not go into that greater detail, but we will are very likely to ask institutions to report the number of teacher education students you had in clinical placements, or in, in, in this case, student teaching. Report the number of nursing students uh, you had in other states. Report the number of psychology students you had in other states. You get the general idea. Uh, we want to uh, we want to be as logical about this as possible. We want to provide, uh, we, we want to ask the least possible of you in regard to that. Um, 
and the SIP code system is used and understood by IPEDS reporters and by instructional uh, or institutional research people. It's been around for decades and we are not going to invent something new uh, about this. So that is what I'm pretty sure things are going to be and we will be getting a group together to, uh, to think about this a little bit and, and provide it. We will give you a heads up about this as soon as possible. I'm certainly aware that many institutions have no idea in any centralized place how many of these placements there are. Um, <clears throat> and uh, why do we care? Well, in many states regard those kinds of placements as triggering physical presence. Now, your institution's participation in SARA relieves you of some of that concern, but nevertheless, uh, in some states it remains a problem. Uh, and as I indicated earlier, our commitment to the state regulators is that we will pro try to provide them information about what kinds of activities are going on in their state. And so, sure. so someone on your campus needs to begin gathering in this information in a centralized way. Russ. Uh, it, and if you're done with that, I, I would like to go back to the students versus enrollments sort of thing, just, just to clarify for people. Is that okay, Marshall? Sure. Okay. Uh, that uh, perhaps we need to be a little bit more careful with what we're talking about there because uh, student, I equate with a student headcount, whereas a, enrollments would be, you could have one student who's enrolled in two, three, five, eight classes in, oh, a, yeah, right. in, a, in a term. So we're, we're really talking about student student head counts and so one student maybe has three courses at a distance and they would be in and another course may have four courses they're taking at a distance and they would be counted but they would be counted just as one head count student and so just wanted to be, make sure we're clear on that yeah that's that's correct okay that's great okay the next question uh, this person was asking, when do you think they will be able to see the actual form in which the data is input? I, I assume that we've means... Already, okay. We have already provided that. Okay. Look, look in, the, uh, in the enrollment guide. You'll see a screenshot. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a list of states, uh, all states, and then just a blank space for the number of students to be uh, input by you. Yep. Okay. It's exactly the same as last year's. Uh, and uh, look in the data guide. I can't recall which page, but... There, there are three screenshots. But, one of the Sarah states, one of the non-Sarah <clears throat> states, and I think I even included a screenshot of the comment box. But that's really all that's going to be on this. Right. Okay. And then uh, the next question is, uh, they were wondering where in general is the SARA administration housing, um, where is the general SARA administration housed within the institutions? Who's, who's collecting that kind of information? Who's managing the, the, SARA, the SARA administration? Uh, yeah. It seems yeah. to vary. Yeah, I think it is very varied. Uh, and. Um, uh, we don't plan to ask institutions about that, but I believe, Cheryl, that you recently sent out uh, a questionnaire to your members, right? Yes, we did. Yeah, so we'll be interested in, in seeing that. Uh, you know, uh, from anecdotal information and talking to people at institutions, it's just all over the place. Sometimes it's within enrollment management. Often it's within uh, the IR unit. Sometimes in a larger school there's a separate department or uh, unit for distance education. Sometimes it's within the academic affairs office. It, it just varies enormously.
dependent upon the institution's level of distance education activity and the size of the institution uh, and so forth. So we don't have an answer to that, but maybe in a while Cheryl can provide uh, <laughs> a snapshot at least of her members and how they yes. do it. Okay, we can certainly do that. Uh, and we have a question about hybrid courses. How are they to be viewed? Are, are, how are hybrid and distance education uh, distinguished for reporting purposes? <sighs> Russ helped me on this, but uh, I, I believe it's exclusively distance education. Yeah, if we could go back up a few slides to the definition that I provided, Cheryl. Sure. Um, so uh, here's the problem, that there are different definitions to, depending on who you're re reporting <laughs> to. Uh, let's see, we need to go, there you go. And so here's the, the, de the official distance education course definition. Remember that we're counting courses. Uh, how many students did, did they, how many courses did they take and were they distance education courses? So you can see I've been talking about the, what they say, uh, what I've classified as, you know, nearly 100% of the activity uh, takes place at, at mm -hmm. a distance. And so uh, you see there for uh, requirements for coming to campus for orientation, testing, those sorts of things are, uh, that's still counted as a distance ed course. Now I know that if you're reporting to some of the uh, uh, regional accrediting agencies that they're using a 50% uh, threshold. If you're reporting to some of the state agencies, they're, they're using 70, 75%, 95% thresholds depending on the, uh, on the state. And so I think it's up to you to, so, so I think that they're trying to keep away hybrid courses. But where you draw the line, uh, use this definition, use whatever definitions that, that, that you decide that you're going to use, and then decide locally what you're going to call a distance education course, and then uh, apply that uh, the same, well, whether you are reporting to IPEDS or reporting, uh, reporting to SARA. And so here's the official definition of what, of what uh, IPEDS have asked for, but I know that some I've talked to some institutional research people who've objected to using it because they didn't want to report one thing to the state and one another thing to iPads. And so you'll have to work that out um, with your institutional research people uh, to, to battle it. All I can give you is what the official answer is here with the iPads uh, definition. Yeah, is this the way things would work in a better world? No, <laughs> absolutely not. But it's a challenge and this is the best we can do, we think. Um, do what you did for iPads, uh, even though that is frustrating and may not accurately capture, at least in your mind, what you are doing, but th that's the best we can do. Okay. Uh, this is back to one of those uh, questions about whether there are multiple campuses as a part of an institution. So this particular institution has a campus in Georgia and a campus in Florida. So they are wondering if they exclude students in the states that they have campuses. Again, report in exactly the same way you did to iPads. Figure out Talk to your iPads coordinator. Every institution has, that participates in federal Title IV financial aid programs has to report to iPads. <clears throat> Find that person and let them make that decision for you. Uh, have them report it in the same way. Uh, there could be a number of variables here. You know, that it, some branch campuses of institutions have separate accreditation. Some operate under the accreditation of the main campus. Uh, and an and entire range of alternatives, uh, ways to operate. So do it the same way you did to iPads. And Marshall, uh, this is Russ again. and, and uh... I, I totally agree that you should do it the same way that you did for for iPads. My feeling is is that it, typically there's there's one iPads ID number under which you're reporting, and that's 
that is associated with one state, uh, whatever your home state is. And so if you're separately accredited and have separate iPads numbers, you should be reporting those separately and that you would yeah. treat them as separate campuses. But but really, if you do have branch campuses and there's a very, very specific definition of a branch campus versus a location versus other, other sorts of things, mm -hmm that those sorts of things typically are rolled up into the uh, into the main campus and that uh, that you would see those other states as being uh, being that you would re you would report the numbers to Sarah from those states I guess would be the bottom line for this for this for this question uh, that that would be my advice yeah uh, on the first text page of the data enrollment reporting guide, I, I have a sentence in there that caught it, it's not on this, uh, oh, okay. in this slide deck, Cheryl. Okay. But it, it's, it's a question about what if, what if you're confused about this? What if you can't decide how to report? Uh, I, I offer two general guides and my colleagues are mixed about whether it's appropriate for us to do that. The first says report as you did to iPads. Everybody pretty much agrees on that. And the second is if you're still confused, make your decision on the basis of the general spirit and idea of Sarah. What we're really trying to capture here through a very imperfect system is how many students are institutions that are participating in SARA serving in states other than their own? Now think about that for a minute. Uh, we can very easily say there are 47 states plus the District of Columbia currently participating in SARA, members of SARA. And there are about 1,450 institutions participating in SARA. And then if someone asks, well, how many students is SARA affecting? How many students are served by those member institutions? How many students are enrolled in states other than the state of the institutions? Th those are reasonable questions to ask. Uh, and, uh, and we don't have a good answer to any of them. And there is not uh, a real good uh, estimate of what that number is. I think as we go through this process and it gets better with each iteration, I think we'll get closer to having an answer that, may, that, uh, that can be useful uh, in several ways, uh, especially if we ever want to um, want to raise any other grant money. Uh, grantor organizations are quite interested in how much effect money that they would provide to an organization might have. So that and the, the pact and agreement with our colleague regulators, uh, we hope that we'll eventually be able to provide better data than we now do. Okay. Uh, we have a question about a Sarah location, a Sarah, a Sarah State, that uh, is still asking for some kind of data. Are they, the, the institution wants to know if they are still required to be reporting to those Sarah States. Um, well, my friend Russ has a really good answer that fits perfectly well right here. And the answer is, it depends. <laughs> so there are several, there are several um, things that could make that be a reasonable thing for a state to do. One, if an institution has triggered physical presence, has established a campus in a state, uh, let's say, for example, the University of Phoenix, since everyone is familiar with them, uh, if the University of Phoenix has a campus in Georgia, which they do, and nevertheless enrolls online students from Georgia, which they do, the state of Georgia can, within SARA, 
uh, policies request additional information from the University of Phoenix. Uh, another case uh, states uh, particularly uh, in regard to programs that are intended to lead to professional licensure, such as nursing, psychology, teacher education, allied health, uh, entities within that state uh, can, uh, can require the provision of, in, of information from uh, an out-of-state SARA institution. And then lastly, uh, SARA is still evolving. Uh, and we, we are dealing with 54 states, territories, and districts who have all done things in different ways. And getting them to willingly and attentively do the same thing has been a challenge, as you'd expect. So if you have a particular issue about this that still troubles you after this brief explanation of mine. Uh, contact your, your state's SARA portal entity and or your regional compact director and they will help you work through this. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is a follow-up to Russ and Marshall's answer on the iPEDS reporting. If a student has a, if, excuse me, if a student has a very low residency program with all courses online except a three-week residency, then uh, they want to confirm whether they should not report those students um, via SARA during the one semester they have an on-the-ground course at the home institution. Is that correct? What would your answer be, Ross? I, I think that would be correct because, uh, again, we're talking about the, the student has X number of enrollments. One of the enrollments is face-to-face. -face. Therefore, it's not exclusively distance education for that term. Okay. Uh, the I, I'm, not, I'm not happy with that answer, but I agree with it. Yeah, okay. I, it, 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 it could be better, but it's what is where we're at with the definitions, yes. Right. Okay, we seem to have about uh, five or six more questions that I know that we're not going to be able to, oh, there's more than that. Uh, I just wanted to share with all of you that we see the questions here, and we're going to make sure that we get these, an these questions to the presenters to get some answers, and we will provide those answers for you when we send out the link for the recording and when we send the uh, slide deck. Again, if you would like the slide deck right now, you can find it in the handout section on the uh, dashboard and it's under handouts uh, it's a PDF file and I want to also alert you to some slides here of who we are um, this has been brought to you by the WCET State Authorization Network uh, you can find our um, contact information here web page and the Frontiers blog and you can learn more and stay connected by uh, looking at the WCET website. It's uh, full of information. Please consider joining our community. And you can learn more and stay connected through a variety of activities that we have in the upcoming months. There's a WCET Leadership Summit in Salt Lake City in June. Uh, in September, there will be a WCET State Authorization Compliance Workshop. It'll be back to basics. And it'll be for those that are at your institution who are new to the state authorization topic. It could be an IT, financial aid, registrar's office, anyone who is working with these regulations, even with the compliance officers. And, of course, we will have the WCET annual meeting in October. And I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Megan because uh, you'll see here that we have uh, – uh, Megan, are you still on? Um, we have our sponsors here. Uh, we have supporting members for, uh, we thank them for their commitment to WCET and e-learning, Colorado State University, Cooley, LLP, uh, Lone Star College System, Michigan State University, University of Missouri, Columbia, Mizzou Online, and University of North Texas, and of course our annual sponsors. Great. Thank you so much, Cheryl, and thank you all for joining us. Wonderful job to our presenters, Russ, Marshall, and Jennifer. We hope to see you on the next WCET webcast. Have a good day, all. Thank you.